In recent weeks, we have taken witness to an energy which is surfacing around the country, an energy which brings into focus a little small city like Jackson, Mississippi, and our recent declaration that we will be the most radical city on the planet. As one of the earlier speakers uh, took note of, he said that this is a declaration that some people find great joy in and others trepidation. And so we visit this concept of what is the most radical city on the planet. It is our objective in abandoning the norms of how we've seen electoral politics over time, moving away from models where we build great buildings and nice new edifices only to move people from one state of misery to the next. So instead of moving the people away, it is our objective to lift the people up. And we believe that Mississippi is the place that this must happen because of some of the most negative and, and vile history we've seen over time has occurred in this space. And so, in essence, we are merging two things that have appeared to be polar opposites over time, the idea of being a revolutionary and the idea of the use of electoral politics. So now we consider, at this time, the idea of electoral politics, the new revolution. In order to begin this discussion and how we come to this place at this time in Jackson, Mississippi. We have to revisit a different era. I want to take you back to August, the summer of 1971. In a house at 1148 Lewis Street. And an organization called the Republic of New Africa. This is a conversation that many people in the community know about, but it is rarely spoken of. Depending on your age, you may not be familiar. This was an organization which focus was about bringing forth a new system or a new society, one where people who had been left on the fringes or who had been exploited or, or disenfranchised had opportunity to seek independence for themselves. In large part, we're talking about the African-American community. This organization sought through some very revolutionary practices to seek the opportunity for independence. And they were met with a political system at that time and a, a police organization that had one black officer, one black officer who only had the ability to arrest black people. And in that summer of August of 1971, a home that was often filled with men, women, and children was fired upon, where they brought in a tank that was affectionately known as the Thompson tank, and they shot up the house only for the men at that time that were inside the home to return fire. And unfortunately, it ended in a fatality. So what we're looking at is a very different time in the same place that we are today, where opportunities for people to change a system and to have more access to their government was not one that was afforded to them. And so we have to truly have a context of history and be prepared to address the contradictions within ourselves in order to explore new alternatives and how we can still pursue the ideals that we all subscribe to, the ideas that we all want to enjoy, the ideas that our government serves us all, and look at being revolutionaries through the lens of electoral politics. Often we're fearful of the word revolutionary or fearful of the word radical, and we have to ask the question why.
Oftentimes, we fail to really think of the definition of a radical. A radical is a person who seeks change. And if you look at the state of your community, if you look outside of these walls and you see a need for change, then I would suggest that we all need to be prepared to be as radical as the circumstances dictate we should be. So how do we revolutionize a political system? How do we move from a day of old like the RNA 11 to a new system of governance that supports us all? A new opportunity to work collaboratively, to employ our collective genius. And that is just the mission that we are on today because we feel that this place that has been known for so much negativity over time that it is only befitting that we would be the authors of a new story. That not only we would correct the ills that we see in Jackson, Mississippi, but that we become a model for the world. As we see a world that is in more and more flux each and every day, this is a necessary proposition. I often think about the great benefit that I had to live in the house with my hero. The story of the RNA was often the bedtime stories that I heard of, and in fact, my parents moved us back to Jackson, Mississippi, or moved us to Jackson, Mississippi in 1988. Not because we had grandparents here, not because I had aunts and uncles to welcome us, but because my parents believed in a movement to change conditions for people. And they saw a necessary part of that movement was offering their most precious resource, their children. And so they made a conscious decision to move us to Jackson, Mississippi, and it was honestly the best decision that they ever made. And so this work that we are pursuing is as much for me about how we create a new condition, a new society, as it is keeping my parents alive. I think back to my father's election where a gentleman who was a part of this very radical group, the RNA, was able to ascend to the city's highest office. And what a miraculous moment that was. And he reminded me that it was less a statement about him and his accomplishment and more a statement about where the people of Jackson found themselves. The bold stance that people in this city were prepared to take on. And he'd said that the selection of our leadership demonstrates the readiness of the people. A very profound statement. And as we look at the culture of Jackson and look at the culture that is taking place around the world, we have to ask ourselves, what are we ready for? And what are we prepared to do in order to get there? I often like to use this quote where I talk about this task and where we are headed. Talk about the fact that we see a world that there seems to be a lack of integrity everywhere we look. And so we ask the question, what do you do when you find a lack of integrity everywhere you look? You find it in yourself and you begin to change the world from right where you're standing. Who is the author of this wonderful quote? Actually, it's Madam Secretary, my wife and I's my favorite show. <laughs> but I found it to be such a profound question. And it brings into full context what our challenges are and what we must do in order to overcome them. We have to be prepared to have sincere disagreement for sincere people should be able to have sincere disagreement where we could subscribe to the notion of unity, debate, unity. We can all arrive in the world and, or arrive into a room and identify where we see eye to eye and be prepared to debate where we may have differences with the objective of reaching greater unity at the end of the day than we walked in with. Four, our goal in debate must not be victory, 
Our goal in debate should be progress. And if we subscribe to this process, then we should be able to overcome our differences. So I am the child of two activists, and so I have a propensity to speak to the larger things in life, like human rights and social justice and self-determination. But as I quickly learned on the campaign trail, when you knock on a gentleman or a lady's door and you talk about these great big uh, ideas, you're confronted with a brother or a sister who says, yeah, yeah, that's good, young brother, but uh, how are you going to fix that pothole in the middle of my street? And so that literally becomes our mission, meeting people where they are and addressing the issues that they confront day to day and finding ways to use that in order to have greater discussions on issues that affect them. It is literally the process of connecting pothole to pothole and community to community. So people in Jackson, Mississippi understand why there's a community that looks just like theirs in Gary, Indiana, in Washington, D.C., in Brooklyn, New York, in Detroit, Michigan. And then ultimately what we learn is that the reason that you suffer from your infrastructure woes is because none of you control the process which leads to a pothole being replaced in the first place. None of you have self-determination. And so we're looking at how we revolutionize the way we look at electoral politics so that people have more say-so so that we look at collective genius understanding that one person or one administration for that matter does not have all of the ideas for all of the people. And so we explore this concept of what we call a dignity economy. An economy that doesn't look to rob Peter to pay Paul but instead allows people to contribute to the process. We look at the idea of things like participatory budgeting so people can place value on, on where they want their money to go. It is the shift in the paradigm from finding value in what you're adding to adding what you find value in. We have two options. We have the options of economics for the people and by the people or the option of economics by a few people for themselves. And so as we explore what this looks like, we must see a city that looks to have healthy citizens, safe and affordable communities, thriving educational opportunities, a growing tax base with op occupational opportunities, and a city that is welcoming and open to visitors, inviting all people of goodwill and sincerity to join us. One of the things that I found very uh, interesting in my early time in this administration is that the only thing that people are more interested in than potholes apparently was the vegan challenge that I took on at the start of my administration. In fact, the most challenging part of that challenge was explaining to my wife how Pamela Anderson knew me <laughs> and decided to challenge me to this vegan challenge. But as we look at being the most radical city, we truly have to account for where, what we are putting in our bodies and what we are building and what we are encouraging as a society. And the greatest challenge of Taking on a vegan lifestyle, I have learned, is not just the mere decision to eat healthy, but the access that we see in our communities. The fact that we are living in food deserts where, as one of our earlier presenters recognized, it is the antithesis of our culture to choose a vegan lifestyle. We had the opportunity to travel not only the city of Jackson, but around the state as we were going through this 30-day challenge. And people, as you stated, that you were 
not eating any products from an animal, whether it be the meat or any dairy products, people looked at us like unicorns, something that they had never seen. So it is imperative that we raise the conversation, the discussion about what we're building in our community and how we start to see access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Safe and affordable homes. This is one of the most critical discussions as we look at some of the traditional models of how we have built cities over time. And the idea and the concept of gentrification, which is a war against the people, moving people from one state of misery to the next. And so we have to look at opportunities and how we build communities where people of different backgrounds, different financial means can live amongst each other in safety and in harmony. And though this appears to be a daunting task, I think that it is incumbent upon us that we present this new picture to the world. Thriving educational opportunities. In recent weeks, we've taken note of the fact that Jackson provides some of the lowest wage jobs. Yet, we are a college town that produces some of the highest wage skill sets. So Jackson, like many other cities, is a city that doesn't have a problem producing wealth, but has a problem maintaining wealth. Therefore, our greatest exports as a city are our money and our talent. And we have to look at the solutions of how we reverse course and create career pathways right here in Jackson, where we make our city into a classroom for the young people that pass through our city limits each day seeking educational opportunities. So they see a space where they can take up, take root, and be a part of what we are building. A growing tax base with those occupational opportunities that I just spoke of. Looking at creative ways in how we will create the economic opportunities that we seek. Exploring things that actually take root right here in Jackson, Mississippi, or in Mississippi through the context of people like Fannie Lou Hamer, who looked at how we look at cooperative businesses, businesses that are owned by the community, where people can not only decide how they'll labor, but what the fruits of their labor will be. And at this time, we are inviting people as the country is looking at us, all people of goodwill and sincerity to join us, as we not only look at how we repair Jackson, but how we build a new society. For we see Jackson as a city which is pregnant with possibilities. And as I use this analogy, I speak about what pregnancy is, and in fact, I ask that all of the women in the audience and the women who will see this, that they forgive me for I am a man who has never experienced pregnancy, of course. But as I understand it, pregnancy is a difficult time and a difficult struggle where you go through the labor pains only to witness the most beautiful thing at the end of the day. And so we see a city that is prepared to go through a number of struggles, a number of battles. But what we are looking forward to truly is a beautiful image. And it is consistent with the ideas that Martin Luther King began to understand in his final days. Martin had a conversation with Harry Belafonte where he said, listen, Harry, I, be I believe we're going to win this integration struggle. But I'm beginning to wonder, I'm beginning to wonder if we're not integrating into a burning house. He began to see how the system was exploiting people and exploiting labor and exploiting opportunities. And he wanted to know if it was worth integrating into a house that looked like that. And so he realized that it was more than just a question of social ideas. And he said that we can't walk Mississippi roads together if we first can't come to a place where we're able to share goods, resources, and power. And so ultimately, it becomes greater than a question of color. It becomes a question of ideas and who has the best ideas and who has the worst ideas. And what the worst ideas are 
is that you can exploit anybody. Thank you.